Sabbath morning, you never know who's going to walk through the doors. A dear friend of mine, Bob Burnett, is here this morning. And Bob, Bob is with Native American Ministries. I'm asking to take just a minute to a couple of minutes to share about Native American Ministry. And Bob, would you introduce to the congregation a friend who invited you to church? Let's turn right up here so you can hear you. I, I have the pri privilege of working with Pastor Dennis way back in 98, 2000, mm -hmm. when he was in the Dakota Conference. Um, you know, this year, we baptized 23 people into Christ mm -hmm. in the Pine Ridge area because of the work that he helped us establish way back then, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. His legacy continues, and I don't say that lightly. He helped us build a center there and make an impression that has lasted and lasted and lasted. And I so appreciate his leadership in the various conferences where he's worked and makes such a significant difference. Not just in our work, but the work in general. And how much I learned from him and Elder Orion that he worked with. The two men together, how much there was in camaraderie and the, the amount of power of work in the gospel that they got done under their leadership. So thankful. I was stunned when I walked in and saw him. Um, I, I'm here due to a miracle. But the work that I do in Denver, we met with all of the tribes in North America as we normally do. We have a health program. And at that time, we held two banquets. They didn't, we didn't use the name Native Ministries that the church has used for several years. So this year we used the name Seventh-day Adventist Church. At our two banquets, one on Sunday and one on Wednesday, tribal leaders came in and spoke to us. President Begay of the Navajo Nation himself stayed about an hour and a half and talked to me about seven specific areas. He said to me, as I travel, I've gone into Seventh-day Adventist churches and no one knows who I am. I've gone into your stores, I buy your food, my wife and I have become vegetarians. And we would like your influence on our nation. This goes with the 266 villages in Alaska who went, met with me and said we need the Seventh-day Adventist health message. Wow. This goes with all the tribes in Northern California who had a meeting this past Thursday with our Adventist physicians that we're working with and said, we want the Adventist health systems amongst all our people of all of our tribes of Northern California. Wow. This is happening across North America, but it's happening in a big way because of someone you have here. I remember the first time I got to know her was way back around 98, 2000. And um, at a meeting of all the tribes, the National Congress of American Indians, it's an entity set up by the federal government back in the 40s. They were in some financial trouble and they wanted someone to straighten it out and she had been, uh, her nation selects three chiefs and then those chiefs select one to lead and she'd been doing that for a long time and a great amount of respect. So a movement carried forward at those meetings and they elected her treasurer. Um, a memory I have always had is when each person who was elected got up to give their talk, is her people locked the doors there at the meetings. Uh, Mohawk warriors are known to be really big. And um, she said, we're going to do something I heard from Bob Burnett, I learned from Bob. We're going to pass the plate, like you guys did this morning. And they couldn't get out because the doors were shut. <laughs> She collected the money to put back the finances, and they've been good ever since. She was treasurer as long as they could keep her in. And National Congress of American Indians has had financial stability ever since that time, and she is known for that. The trust that all those tribes had to put the money into that plate and to trust her to manage it and lead it and pull them out. So for over 10 years, I've gone to her. And at the National Congress, the Seventh-day Adventists have helped lose 9 to 12 every year, where we do health screening with tribal leaders and health directors. She's the person who has them come in and get their blood glucose tested, their BMI checked, 
their, their blood pressure checked, all of that done. She has the type of reputation that I'll go to her and say, I want to meet with this tribal leader over this tribe, and whether it's the Cherokees or the Navajo, doesn't make any difference how big the nation is. She grabs them and says, come with me now, and they go with her. That's the kind of clout she has amongst all the 566 tribes of North America. I was, so, so, I've been at the GC this week, the North American Division, with meetings with Elder Jackson and Elder Denslow. And then I was to go fly yesterday to Seattle to meet with the tribes, tribal leaders, but my flight got canceled. They had routed me through New York and with the rain up in the Northeast, the flights got killed. And I received two, three calls from people that are near Elma's Nation. Mike Cook, who's the Indian Health Director for that whole region up there. Mike considers himself one of her boys. Alma brought him into his church, raised him up, and that's where he considers him one of Alma's boys. And they were all concerned about her. So I prayed to the Lord and everything, and I called her yesterday afternoon, and I got myself on a flight to come here just to go to church with Alma. Praise the Lord. Um, she, her husband passed away a year ago, and she has started coming to your church on a regular basis. And I will hope you love her like the 566 tribes and all of us love her so much. She has been a pillar for the work, although she's not a baptized member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But she has been a pillar of the work for Native Ministries for close to 20 years or more than that. And um, like Pastor Dennis said, you don't know who's going to walk through your door. A lot of what we've been able to achieve is because of her credibility, her strength and leadership. In Indian country, it's not what you say, it's how you walk in your words. Amen. And that influence that she has, has lended that over to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it was exciting to me to learn that since our meetings in Denver, where a total now of over 400 tribes have said, they want the, a partnership with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, that she's been here and going to your church. Amen. So, um, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. And I'm, I was so excited to see him. I hadn't seen him for so long. Yes, well, uh, we, thank you for sharing. Praise the Lord for all he has been doing and is doing, especially now. You know, it's something to think about. I don't know if you realize. Each one of those tribes are sovereign, to the federal government under treaties, they're the equivalent of another state. Most people don't understand that. So you have 400 states who are saying we now want to work with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. Amen. Praise Him. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Bob. It's amazing how God works, isn't it? Especially behind the scenes with individuals uplifting Christ and making a difference for the kingdom. I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Long before silver bells rang or Christmas lights twinkled or horse-drawn sleighs went dashing through the snow, God intervened from heaven to earth. And he gave us the greatest of all gifts. Love wrapped in swaddling clothes and hope nestled in a manger. In Luke, we discover three women who play a significant role in the birth of the Messiah. We've got Elizabeth, Mary and Anna. Their lives are markedly different. Elizabeth was Mary, settled and advanced in years. Her cousin Mary was young, still living at home and engaged to a carpenter. And Anna was very elderly. She was a widow and she spent every waking hour at the temple. All three of these women were longing for the coming of the Messiah. But our focus today would primarily be with, would, would be with Elizabeth 
and of her husband Zechariah. Notice verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias, one of the divisions of Abijah, and, his, and he had a wife and the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. You'll notice in Luke's account that the kings and the governors of Judea had no direct involvement with the Christmas story. And Herod, this is Herod the Great, the Edomite, not very popular in the scriptures. And Herod has that title that Luke tells us about, King of Judea. But you remember when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified as King of the Jews. And Jesus carries the title King of Kings. Now Zacharias was just an ordinary priest. And there were hundreds of them. And since the time of Aaron, the, the role of the priest was to handle the many different feasts that took place, the offerings, to give thanks, to sing praises at the temple gate. It's good we don't do that anymore because it'd be terrible if I was standing out in front of the church singing. And so when Zacharias is called to minister in the holy place, this is an honor that was very rare because there were so many priests. And then you've got Elizabeth, who spent many of her hours keeping her husband's priestly garb in, in good, good order, and welcoming people into her house to talk about temple matters. That was verse 6. It says, they were both righteous in the sight of God, blameless in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. When Luke says they were blameless, he's not saying they were sinless. But he is saying they were righteous. They loved God so much, they surrendered their lives to Him. And in the language that Luke is using, he's connecting their faithfulness from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And you notice what he tells us about Elizabeth, that she was barren and that she was too old to have a child. But God works miracles, just as he did in the life of Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Hannah. When you're first reading this account, it almost sounds like he's saying, Zechariah and Elizabeth have got it all together. And that God is lucky to have them. But that's not what Luke is trying to say. What he's trying to say is that they're righteous because of God's grace. Because of his, because of his love and because of his spiritual power. That God is working in their lives and it reflects in the way they live and how they interact with people. And it's the same for us. Although we're sometimes tempted to praise people because they're so righteous and, and so spiritual. But really the one we should be praising is God because we're all sinners. We're all struggling against the forces of evil. And God is making us righteous. Yeah. Now, if you hold your finger in Luke 1 and flip over to Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul gives us one of the signature scriptures on what it means to walk with the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is what? A gift of God. It's a gift of God. He is more willing to give it to us than we are to ask for it. Verse 9, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. In verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Paul's describing Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now, 
can tell about the good things about them, but now it's time for the other shoe to drop. When God's blessings are overflowing, it's so easy to be faithful, isn't it? But when disappointment calls, and when sorrow pulls up its chair, sometimes we're challenged to be faithful. Notice verse 7. Luke says of Zechariah, specifically of Elizabeth, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Elizabeth and Zechariah represent God's people seemingly without hope for the future. Elizabeth grace, Elizabeth's disgrace, her barrenness, was a metaphor for Israel's disgrace and spiritual barrenness. It explains why the, this miraculous birth of John was so significant to this couple. It was good news for a comfortless nation. When you think about it, even with all their goodness, with all their righteousness, with all their acts of compassion and kindness, sadness has creeped into their hearts, into their family. Because, you see, in their culture, for a woman not to have a child meant there must be something displeasing to God about them. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine the questions that must have going through their minds like, Lord, have we not been faithful enough? Or, Lord, have we dishonored you in some way? But it must have really hurt when they would hear the words of the psalmist, the fruit of the womb is a divine reward. Zechariah and Elizabeth wore smiles on the outside, but on the inside they were aching. And they realized that some of their neighbors all ill of them because Elizabeth was barren. Because some of her neighbors must have wondered. I wonder what Elizabeth did wrong that God cursed her and made her barren. Because in the eyes of her neighbors, Elizabeth had failed at the most basic level. Because a wife was expected to give her husband sons. To maintain the honor of his name. And the consequences of not doing that would be disfavor, humiliation, and even divorce. Luke's assertion that, that they are righteous and blameless makes it clear that sinfulness is not the reason that she's barren. And then there's, there's this interesting paradox. If you hold your finger in Luke 1 and flip to the front of your Bible, to the book of Deuteronomy, to the 7th chapter. Deuteronomy 7, verse 14. This is a promise that every Jewish woman would cling to. Deuteronomy 7, verse 14. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall be no male or female barren among you or your cattle. Imagine how Elizabeth must have felt when she would read the words of Moses. Elizabeth and Zechariah then represent God's people seemingly without hope for a future. But the one thing I really like about these two people is they never allowed bitterness into their hearts. They didn't understand what God was doing. They didn't understand why they didn't have children. But they knew they could trust God. Amen. And so they surrendered their lives to Him and spent their lives serving Him. And serving Him. And maybe that's one reason why God calls them righteous and blameless. Sometimes we might be tempted be angry with God, or festering, whether it be the loss of a child prematurely, maybe financial collapse, or maybe dealing with a child who falls into calamity or to some serious crimes, or 
and unfortunate accidents, hard times are often difficult to explain. I remember Hannah's husband, when he's, well, she said, I remember, in scripture it says, Hannah's husband would say to her, aren't I worth more to you than sons? Well, obviously he didn't realize the pain that she was in. Elizabeth needed a miracle. Because she was not only barren, but she was past her prime. <coughs> she was past her menopause, and, and Luke says they were both very old. Now, we don't know how old very old is. We only know, as Luke says, they were advanced in years. And more to the point, there was no chance of their having children because of their advanced in age. And yet there's that story of Abraham and Sarah. Remember how old Sarah was? 90 years old. And she's holding a brand new baby in her arms. And stories like that would give hope to people like Zacharias and Elizabeth. Well, as Luke's story continues, Zechariah is performing his priestly duties when the unexpected happened. Notice verse 9 of Luke chapter 1. According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Because there were so many priests, for Zacharias, this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. All the worshipers were outside praying. Verse 10, the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. Now Elizabeth possibly was among this, these believers, and if she was, she'd be in the court of women, uplifting their hearts to God. This was her husband's big moment. And it wouldn't be surprised if he was a bit nervous. Now, Elizabeth had not given Zechariah a son, but she had given him her support, her faithfulness, her loyalty for the many years they had served in ministry. And you can be sure that if Elizabeth was there, she did her part in being supportive and in praying, may my prayer be set before you like incense. Yes. Now, um, Zechariah's job for seven days would be to burn those incense. And before him stood the altar made of wood and covered with pure gold. Twice as tall as it was wide, the waist-high altar had a golden horn on each corner. Then there was the golden table of presents, and on the other, the golden lampstand. Everything was in place. Everything was as it should be, as expected. But then notice verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And notice that Luke tells us that the angel is on the right side of the altar, Amen. indicating God's pleasure. Amen. This is not good news. This is great news. And Zechariah wasn't prepared for an angel to appear. He'd never seen an angel. He'd never touched one. He'd never been in the presence of an angel. Verse 12, And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Would you be a little nervous? Actually, in the Greek it says that he was exceedingly terrified. I think we'd probably be the same way. Now, Zechariah knew about angels. It's just he never encountered one. He didn't know of any other priest who had ever encountered anyone. Verse 13, but the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him a name, John. Now, the, the angel says your petition has been heard. We might be tempted to say that he's still praying for a baby. But it's more than likely 
That's what he's been praying for is the Messiah. Yes. And the angel said, your prayer for the Messiah has been heard plus. We bought a package of tofu, extra hard. It was called Ek Tofu Plus. I'm sure for some of you that's not too exciting. The angel was saying to Zacharias, your prayers are being heard plus. Your wife's going to have a baby. And you'll call his name John. And can you imagine what must have been going through Zachariah's mind? A baby. A baby. And he's going to be a son. And notice what Luke tells us. The angel said, your wife will give birth. Zacharias wasn't supposed to go out and find some fertile young lady like Abraham and Hagar did. But that his wife would have that miraculous experience that every mother has experienced giving birth to a child. Except in this case, it was even more miraculous because she was barren and advanced in years. And he says, you must call his name John. John means the Lord is gracious. And that certainly is apropos for their situation. And then the angel says, let me tell you about your son. Wouldn't it be neat for a mother before she gives birth to be told the future of her child? Amen. Well, it'd be neat if it's a good future, that is. He says in verse 14, you will have joy and gladness and may rejoice at his birth. Verse 15, and he will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will drink no wine or liquor and he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yet, while yet in his mother's womb. Verse 16. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to their God. And verse 17. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now the angel is quoting Malachi. Remember your church history, Christian history. Malachi was the last prophet of the Old Testament. So it's been 400 years since Israel has had a, a prophet to speak to them about God. He's quoting Malachi 4, verse 5. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Amen. A little side note. It's, we've had almost 2,000 years of silence until the 1800s when God rose up another prophet. The job of, of John the Baptist was to be the Elijah messenger, to preach the Elijah message Amen. that God is coming and that it is a message of righteousness and salvation. Amen. What does that mean for you and I as Seventh-day Adventists? It's our message. It's our message as well. Amen. God miraculously brought into existence the Seventh-day Adventist Church Praise or the Seventh-day Adventist movement. And we have the responsibility of proclaiming the Elijah message. Preparing people for the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's our mission. That's our message. Amen. But imagine all those accolades. All those wonderful things the angel has told Zacharias about his son. And I, you would suspect that he'd be joyful and just excited. But he had a problem. He didn't think that God understood human physiology. <laughs> Even though he's our creator. Because he said to the angel, verse 18, how will I know this? I am old and my wife is advanced in years. He is telling the angel, this God representative, this is not going to happen. Because I am old and she's old. Please explain this to God. <laughs> now, it's easy to find fault with Zacharias, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But I know 
I fall into the same pit myself of questioning God. I'm saying, Lord, do you really mean what you say? Do you really love me that much? Like Zachariah, sometimes we forget who we're talking to. Sometimes we forget who the source of the promises of God's word are. 